Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the Core Area Spring Town Hall. We're going to wait 30 seconds before we get going to give folks a little extra time to sign on. Okay, I hope everyone's had a chance to sign on. Um, welcome everyone. Um, thanks for making time to join our core area spring town hall today. My name's Scott Mathers. I am the uh, deputy city manager of planning and economic development for the city of London. Today's staff from the city of London and tourism London will be sharing updates related to some of the strategies, plans, programs and events that are taking place in our core area. Just want you to note that we're recording this meeting and it'll be posted at london.ca slash core area um, at a future date. Presentation will also be follow it, followed up by question and answer period. So please use the Q&A feature on Zoom to submit a question at any point during this webinar. And we will answer questions at the end of the presentation. Before we begin, I'd like to provide a, a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that we are gathered today on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, Lenapewak, Ainuwandran peoples. We honor and respect the history, languages, and culture of the diverse Indigenous people who call this territory home. We acknowledge all the treaties that are specific to this area, the Two Row Wampum Treaty, Rontum Belt Treaty, of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, Silver Covenant Chain, the Beaver Hunting Grounds of the Haudenosaunee Nan Fan Treaty of 1701, the McKee Treaty of 1790, the London Township Treaty of 1796, the Huron Track Treaty of 1827, with the Anishinaabek and the Dish with One Spoon Covenant Wampum, the Anishinaabek and Haudenosaunee. The three Indigenous nations that are neighbors to London are the Chippewas of the Thames First Nation, the Nida Nation of the Thames, and the Muncie Delaware Nation, who all continue to live as sovereign nations with individual and unique languages, cultures, and customs. Now I'd like to provide an overview of today's talk. And just before I do that, I'm just going to switch so that I can actually see the, the presentation. So thanks for your patience there. So um, as far as today, we'll be going through a number of, of different topics on the core. First, we're gonna provide an update of the core area action plan, um, give it some details on the area, the strategy for the core area moving forward. Then we'll have a presentation talking about the community led health and homelessness response. Um, we'll be uh, providing a little bit of information on incentives and funding available for core area business. Uh, and then some good news stories about things that are that are great that are happening in our core area. Next slide. So with that, I'm just going to go through for you. I'm sure that you're all familiar with this. It's a slide we bring up every time, but it just highlights the um, the actual boundaries of the core area. So we hear us talking about the core area, um, and the core area is made up of three distinct, uh, very unique um, communities, including the downtown, Old East Village, and uh, Midtown as well. So um, we're all on the same same playing field as far as what we're talking about as far as, as far as the core area is concerned. Next slide. So I want to give you a, a heads up on a few different initiatives that will be moving forward to City Council over the next couple months. Um, firstly, we've been doing a five year review and thanks for everyone who's been involved and um, has been uh, participated in this process. We'll be, we've done a review of the Community Improvement Plan and Financial Incentive Programs. Um, Jim is going to be talking about the current ones available, but this, this report's gonna be looking at um, some possible changes and uh, the uh, outcome of the review and we heard from uh, the community. We also will be bringing back uh, some study work that was undertaken looking at core area vacancy and uh, specifically commercial vacancies and providing some approaches for, uh, for um, addressing that into the future. Uh, also, we'll be giving an update on our core area action plan and what's uh, the work that's been undertaken over the last year. And then um, we also will be going through uh, those, and I'll talk a little bit more about this further in my presentation, talking about the current strategic plan and um, how we're going to bring about initiatives to be able to support that uh, strategic plan for uh, the core area. So next slide. 
So first, I just wanted to start out with um, some information that's recently come to, to light. And uh, this was some study work done by the University of Toronto and the University of California, Berkeley. Um, there's a full research brief that's available on, online if you're interested in it. And it, it looked at 62 downtown areas throughout North America. So they really focused on municipalities that were larger than 350,000 people. It is really, it was really interesting work in my, my mind. Uh, they looked at phone data of uh, the number of phones that were in the in the core in core areas and uh, compared that before COVID and then after COVID and then they came up with a values of what they felt of the recovery of those downtown areas. So uh, and they laid that out as a percentage. So the number of people that were in those areas down in the downtowns um, before COVID and after COVID. So um, wanted to just provide a little bit of uh, update on that information and let everybody be able to see it. So if we hit to the next slide. Uh, so they what they did, they broke up cities into two categories. Uh, the first category I, I'll talk about is mid-sized cities, but they also looked at large cities. So uh, across North America, looking at these 62 cities, um, they highlighted that London's recovery was about 79%. Um, of course, that's not that's not good enough in my, my opinion, I'm sure everyone else, we'd like to have more people coming to the downtown and getting to 100% or 120%. That's why we developed the core reaction plan was to get, get more folks downtown and, and to have a really um, vibrant community. Um, however, when we compare how London has fared compared to other municipalities in North America and Canada, um, in a relative sense, uh, our community is doing really well in bringing people back to the core. Um, so as far as mid-sized cities, London ranked number one in uh, Canada um, compared to the other um, municipalities in Canada. And then across North America in mid-sized cities, we were uh, 10th, so fairly highly ranked even across North America. And with the next slide, um, I'm showing here the, this is directly from this, this uh, research brief. They've looked at large size cities as well. So uh, when we look at Canada, the closest large size city is uh, Toronto and uh, they've had 53% recovery. Um, so then compared, compared to late to London with 79%, um, we're very, very highly ranked. And if, if you were to combine the two data sets and look at every city that's mid or large size, Canada, um, London would be approximately 14th in North America as far as the recovery of the downtown. And uh, um, as much as that, having a value of 79% um, recovery is, is not, it's not good enough yet. We are doing very well compared to other municipalities, which I think is just a really great testament to all the hard work of the, our businesses, their communities, people who host events in the downtown and, and uh, the residents that are sticking it out and um, as uh, Londoners in the core area. So I just wanted to bring that forward as just a, a little piece of, of good news. It's still, it's not, it's not where we want it, but it's showing that the efforts that the community is making um, in the core area are, are making a difference compared to what's happening in other municipalities. Next slide. So next, I want to talk about some of the, the next steps for our core area and what we're, we're doing from the city side and also in working with the community. Um, so firstly, uh, you may be aware of the core area action plan. That's a program that uh, started in 2019. There was over 70 different initiatives looking at the core and uh, different things that could uh, um, try to improve the situation in the core. Um, one thing that we've recently done in the last uh, six or seven months is uh, highlighted and done an engagement, looking at what the next steps are gonna be for the core area and what the next plan is going to be including in it. So the current plan um, completes at the end of 2023 with the thought that when council brings, the new council comes forward, which they came forward in November of last year, they would create a new strategic plan which would have priorities related to the core. And then we could create new programs coming out of that. So what we really wanted to do was just make sure that the under, our understanding and what we were hearing in the community um, was shared with, with council and, um, and also just to make sure that uh, we're going in the right direction for any future changes. So if we go to the next slide, um, the engagement, it was actually, it got a, a lot of, um, and thank the community and the people on this call that were involved, got a lot of feedback and uh, over 1200 responses. And from a, a very good cross section of, of individuals, um, uh, people that visit, people that work, live, property owners and business owners. So um, it was a very successful approach as far as like getting some comments and engagement. So I wanna share some of that, um, some of that uh, we heard uh, with you today. Uh, this is, these are all slides that we were, yeah, we provided to council as well. So when they were developing the strategic plan that they knew these were some of the things that uh, the Londoners and people who live, work and, 
visit the core, things that they think are very important um, as far as, as issues in the course. So if we go to the next slide, um, as far as the top 10 uh, challenges or issues in the core area, um, for the downtown specifically, have it broken down by each of the three neighborhoods. Um, very much uh, that, that focus on the, the need for homelessness and, and health, and mental health and addictions help for, for people in our core. So um, something that council heard when they were knocking on doors during the election, but also something that came out of this engagement. And it, that really dovetails with uh, the concerns about safety and security. Also very much heard that the need for, uh, for parking and strategies around parking in the core, and then linking with that as well, the violence, crime, and also of course, all the construction um, that, uh, is a, that is happening in the core as well um, as being something that is a, is a challenge for the downtown. Um, next slide, Old East Village, uh, very similar in that focus on homelessness, uh, mental health and addictions, safety and security being a significant concern. And, um, and also this was, a, this was also a common um, and the reason that we were undertaking the core area vacancy study strategy um, was that need for uh, trying to use that existing commercial space in a way that uh, can activate storefronts and, and really help those communities as well. And the next slide is on Midtown. Midtown, um, same types of concerns were shared. Um, also that focus on saying that it would be nice to have uh, more destinations within the area, um, but also just also highlighting the need for parking and, and the impacts of construction as well. So next slide. So with that, this information was shared with council and um, um, for the, you though, Use the, for the folks that haven't been involved in this council every four years when a new council comes forward, one of the first things they do is create a strategic plan. So that really highlights what the new council sees as being very important efforts moving forward. So, um, so uh, um, it highlights the priorities and then as staff, the next piece of it, and I'll talk about this in a, in a few slides as well, is how are we gonna resource that? How are we gonna make sure that we have the programs and, this, and the funding to be able to support what council wants to do uh, moving forward? So with the next slide, it provides a very high level of, um, of what uh, uh, the strategic plan uh, process looks like. It began in December and uh, there was a, a robust uh, public engagement piece with that as well. And I can say today that as of last, uh, as of uh, Tuesday, the strategic plan has been approved and it's gonna be available uh, shortly online for anyone that's interested in it. Um, but today I'm gonna go through some of the pieces that are very much important and uh, for the core area. Um, also as part of this uh, timeline, you'll see uh, the next piece, which is the multi-year budget. And I'll give a little bit of background on that in a couple slides as well. So with the next slide, um, what I will say, which I, which was very important to myself and I'm sure for the community as well, is that um, within this new strategic plan, the core area was specifically like outlined and this has been the most robust uh, um, inclusion of the core area in any strategic plan that we've had so far. So very much highlighted the need for um, and, and the uh, priority for our core. Um, so outcome four is the is the uh, the item that links to the core area, and it talks about London's core area being a vibrant neighborhood and a, an attractive destination. And it does speak to the three neighborhoods within the core area: downtown, midtown, old east village. So re um, related to this outcome, there's four expected results. So to be able to get that this outcome. If we see these, sorry, five expected results, um, if we see that each of these expected results are fulfilled, um, the idea is that we'll have a vibrant neighborhood and attractive destination. So the first expected result is uh, increasing, uh, increased and diversified economic activity. So having a very robust business community and um, within that core area. And each of the expected results have strategies that are linked to it. And um, I'll, I won't go through them one by one, but uh, what we'll be doing as staff is, is looking at how are we going to implement each of these strategies. Um, but it's very important to achieving that expected result. Next slide highlights the, uh, um, the next expected result, which is uh, increasing residential occupancy and livability in the core. So that's much, very much focused on having more people live, um, achieving those London plan goals of uh, providing more intensification, and then also not just having more people in the, in the core, but having it in a place that people want to live. So more amenity space and, and more um, additional places for people to, to live and enjoy in that core area. And there's a series of strategies that link to that as well. 
next slide provides um, is very much focused on that commercial occupancy piece. So it's looking at trying to ensure that we don't have um, that we uh, use that vacant commercial space as best we can and provide programs to be able to support that moving forward. The next expected result, um, if you go to the next slide, the next expected result focuses on um, making the core a place that you actually people want to come and visit. So um, highlighting more activities, events, um, and ensure that those are that are inclusive and they're diverse and they're in, and they're in a location that people want to be able to visit and people can enjoy. Not just the people who live in the downtown, but also the people that are visiting that town from across London and, and the region as well. The next slide. Um, this really speaks to that increased safety in the core piece. So um, there's a, a number of strategies here to try to make it a more robust um, framework to make sure that there's a, a perception of safety in the core. And um, so that, that a very important element um, as well. Uh, what you don't see necessarily called out in the, set, in the core area um, uh, items is a relationship to that health and homelessness piece. So um, historically, health and homelessness was, was definitely something that was uh, very much focused on the core area, but what we're finding is that it's something that is an issue across the city. So there are um, some very uh, robust language in the strategic plan to support that, and Craig will be talking about that in more detail in a moment. So that's not something that's missed. It's just something that we, not that it's, it really does impact the core area, but it's also something that relates to the entire city as well. So the next slide. Um, so where we are in the process now is that we have uh, council has an adopted strategic plan. Uh, staff, we take that back and then develop um, uh, business cases to be able to support what council has brought forward in the strategic plan. In the city of London, if you go to the next slide, we have a multi-year budget process. So what that means is that um, we have a, a budget that we lay out for four years. Um, that four years is, is actually um, will, would start next year and would finish the, um, the year after the new council comes in so that there is um, a, that transition into the new council. And uh, what it, this multi-year budget will do was it'll take those recommendations from the council strategic plan and look at how we could operationalize that, the programs that we're gonna develop and, um, and whatever we're gonna do to support those initiatives over the four year period. Um, as well, annually, there's an update process. So for example, when, when COVID hit in 2020, there was already approved multi-year budget, but because there's an annual process, we can look, um, council can look and staff can pre present changes um, to that approach if we have to course correct over the four year period. But the idea is to have like a four year budget that aligns with everything that, um, that is a, that presented in the strategic plan and allows a, a process to be able to achieve some of those, uh, those goals over a four year period. So the next slide, um, as well, over the, uh, at the last council meeting, there was approval of, of a target setting for the multi-year budget process. So um, council, um, there was a series of reports that came to council and they gave some, some marching orders for staff as far as what they feel will be an appropriate range for tax rate increase. 0.5% um, of that increase would be related to these new core, these, these new um, strategic plan items that have been brought forward by council in the strategic plan. So um, I wanna highlight that for the group because a lot of the core area work um, isn't uh, necessarily work that's, that's, that's already baked into our budgeting process. It was something that was over a, a short period of time. So if these are things that you feel are very important um, from a community perspective, then there will be an engagement process as part of the multi-year budget to make sure that, um, that uh, the value of these programs can be shared with council at the time when they need to make really tough decisions about what items they think should go forward as part of the strategic plan in the multi-year budget process. Next slide, just want to um, give you a few next steps. So there'll be a series of reports coming. There'll be a core area um, report that talks about the last year that's going to come at the end of May, and then a series of other reports, as I'd mentioned. And um, so there's a, a lot of work ongoing and um, uh, really happy to be able to talk through these items today. And I really want to, to flag it for you that um, there'll be some important opportunities for public engagement for the multi-year budget process. And that's likely to start um, uh, in the fall of this year going into the winter. So usually the actual multi-year budget is approved in, in uh, January to February period. And the, that engagement will be happening um, over the fall period as far as hearing from the public about what's important um, 
and included in, in those, those budget submissions. So I want to flag that for you as well. So the next slide, uh, really uh, want to thank you for um, letting me speak to you today. Um, next up, we have Craig Cooper. He's going to give you a little bit of background on an update to our community health and homelessness response. So thank you very much, and I'll pass it off to Craig. Thanks, Scott. Appreciate that, and good morning, everyone. Very happy to be here to chat with you about the community health and homelessness response, the whole of community response, as I'll call it. Uh, but before I get into my slides, I do just want to take a quick moment to recognize the challenges that our community is still facing. And uh, you'll probably see in the CBC News article this morning, the um, death of uh, six individuals that were street involved over the last week. So um, just want to take a moment to reflect on uh, on those challenges that our community and our frontline workers are facing on a day-to-day -day basis and uh, highlight the importance of this work that I'm going to talk about for the next 10 minutes uh, and uh, how we're going to, uh, to support our community uh, in a different way. So the health and homelessness whole of community response um, is really uh, a collective response that over time is expected to change uh, and evolve uh, the priorities and how we support individuals who are experiencing homelessness. Uh, as well as those with severe support needs. Um, we're looking and working together more as a community on how to best deliver uh, the shared commitments and services to build a system that is supporting uh, individuals with mutual respect and care. So you can see there was a number of sessions held uh, in November through January. Uh, the sessions were first of their kind, bringing a significant number of uh, agencies, over 70 different organizations together and 200 people. So the focus, as noted, has been really to establish this whole of community response, uh, and it really highlights the need to have a no wrong door uh, uh, process, as well as multiple locations for people uh, to uh, be met where they're at. Uh, it's ensuring that every entry point is going to offer a range of functions and services that are integrated, multi-agency, and really designed to meet the unique demographic and care needs uh, of the individuals that we serve, and to ensure timely, more direct pathways to housing. So if you go to the next slide. Thanks. So the focus has been for the, the, the community to come together, uh, as noted, to meet people where they're at. And we really believe this group uh, the, and, and myself believe that health care and, and housing are fundamental. They're fundamental human rights. And we must place a high priority on providing direct connections for individuals to the right housing and right supports to meet their needs. So we have to recognize, too, that every individual has to have a sense of belonging for all and that our, our resources need to really be people-centered and housing-centric. And so I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Move on to the next slide. So just a quick overview of kind of where we're at. Uh, as I noted, the summit started in November of 2022, and we're already into system governance model development. And the real key with the system mo uh, model development, the last uh, meeting is this afternoon, actually, is that it's a collective impact model. And so there's a number of uh, collective impact pieces that are very important for this uh, model to have meaningful results. And so that's uh, having a common agenda. So it's really ensuring that all individuals and participants have a, a vision and share this vision for change. And it also includes a very consistent common understanding of the problem and how to approach solving it. We have to have shared measurement. So the data piece of this, we have to agree on what is success and how it will be measured, how it's going to be reported, and what are the common indicators used to learn and to improve the system. We also then have to have mutually reinforcing activities. So that's not recognized we have a diverse set of participants across uh, our multiple sectors. We really need to focus on coordinating activities through that mutually reinforcing plan uh, to support individuals where they're at. The fourth item is continuous, com no, continuous communication. So all participants need to be engaged uh, in different ways and understand that um, communication is structured and open but it needs to build trust and it needs to build mutual objectives and create that common motivation that we need to see some results. And finally, the fifth point is the backbone support. None of this is going to happen if we don't uh, resource these uh, responses correctly. And really that backbone support is that independent function dedicated to provide that ongoing administrative and logistical um, support to this initiative. So you see, we're kind of in that governance piece. Most of that's going to get settled this afternoon. And then we're moving into the implementation phase, which is we can go into the next slide. So the, the work with the group is really in that, co I mentioned that co-design de uh, co model, and we're really focusing on uh, standing up and immediately uh, a response on uh, the homeless hubs, supportive housing, and encampment protocol. 
So those are the three core addition, uh, implementation tables that'll be starting up uh, as early as May, uh, and then uh, with additional implementation tables added at a, at a later time. You can go into the next slide. The real function of the response as, as determined by the community uh, is to really establish a network of 12 to 15 hubs across the community, serving anywhere from 15 to 30 high acuity uh, and uh, moderate and low acuity individuals. It really is uh, focusing on uh, meeting people where they're at and supporting the variety of populations that uh, we see have a need that are experiencing unsheltered homelessness. So as I mentioned earlier, it's gonna be that no wrong door approach. Uh, we'll have multiple location, locations where people can be met where they're at, and we're going to be offering a very wide range of common functions that are integrated into that multi-agency response. So you can move on to the next slide. So in addition to the hubs, we also have the, the need for a continuum range of housing and housing options. And so there is a real focus to, to create 100 supportive housing units uh, in 2023 with an additional 600 total units or a total, sorry, of 600 highly supportive units over the next three years. So that's a, a real uh, a, a significant goal. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, with our communities and everybody who's been at the table, it's something that we're going to be able to meet. And that is going to really help support uh, those folks that um, are, are struggling right now to access services and to access housing. So the real framework of the of the um, support and the response really sets on a number of values and principles. And if you can move into the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about the implementation framework. And I appreciate this is a very busy slide, but on the right, you can see the shared values and principles of uh, the, the group and the whole of community system response. It really focuses on expecting respecting the individual and puts the individual at the center of all of the, uh, the responses. Uh, it is really a people-centered, housing-centric, process uh, and it is really um, intentional to be that the system is being built uh, nothing about us without us approach that's the real key it's engaging people with lived and living experiences so that we can uh, build the system around them uh, through the different circles uh, that are noted below so as we talk about frontline workers which is that second circle out uh, from the the people living in the center it is really is important to understand you know that those to respect those folks that are trying to help uh, the folks that are doing this critical work on the front lines. And it's really important to have those frontline uh, workers also be co-designers uh, of the work uh, and be part of the implementation tables. So from there, we move on to sort of the, the various other uh, uh, tables. And we have a strategy and accountability table, which will look at the funding resources and then our implementation tables as well. We talked about the hubs. We talked a bit about uh, supportive housing. There's also the uh, uh, encampment strategy hub as or table, as well as um, the workforce development table. We heard very loud and clear uh, that we do need uh, significant resources and significant discussion around workforce development. And then from out there, beyond there is uh, sort of the funders. Uh, the city plays a role in that. Uh, other municipality or ministry uh, areas play a, a function in that. And it's really bringing uh, all of that, that resources to bear uh, to that, that individual. We can move on to the next slide. We want to also focus that this work is, is needs to be Indigenous led. Uh, as we see, um, almost 30% of the individuals who are experiencing homelessness in our community identify as Indigenous. So it is a very key uh, component to have um, an Indigenous led response, as well to recognize that uh, the Indigenous experience of homelessness is much different uh, than, uh, than, than any, anybody else's. And we really uh, recognize that there is the um, uh, indigenous definition of homelessness, which really connects an individual back to land, to culture, to family. Uh, it isn't just four walls and a roof, uh, a house kind of thing. It is much more um, uh, connected to, to community, uh, to culture. And so the Giba Tashkad uh, implementation strategy, the, the Indigenous homelessness strategy, is one that uh, was an Indigenous-led uh, uh, plan. Uh, it's been endorsed by council, and uh, the group is in the middle of implementing a number of uh, directions from that plan. We are uh, working with the Indigenous Circle to uh, update that plan in the next uh, year or two uh, to ensure that uh, this work uh, is aligned um, with that. And it's really key part of this work is that it is Indigenous-led uh, by for Indigenous, by Indigenous. And so uh, the work that my team uh, are doing right now is to uh, engage uh, those the Circle um, to have them be a significant proponent and uh, participant in this work. All right, we can move on to the next slide. So this slide speaks a little bit about um, 
the network and sort of how the the work uh, is going to happen from a hub perspective. So uh, on the left hand side here, you can really see that that is sort of the no wrong door approach and, and anybody can make a referral uh, into the system for for an individual who is experiencing homelessness. Um, then there is the hubs in the center, uh, which really means there's the purpose built core functions of that hub. And as you can see on there, uh, there's about 13 different core functions that each hub will do uh, to support their community population uh, and individuals who are experiencing homelessness. At this point, a number of our resources, a number of services within the existing se sector do do a number of these pieces, but I would say no organization does everything at this point in time. So that is part of the shift as we look to kind of continue to transition the current system uh, to ensure we understand how the current system can be maintained while we shift into this, this new system with, with integrating the hubs. And then on the far right is really that timely direct pathway to housing, whether it's um, market housing, nonprofit housing, uh, RGI housing, and supportive housing. It is really key uh, for the journey of the individual between the hub and the housing placement to understand their support needs uh, and ensure that the individual is supported in a timely manner, uh, that one that they're willing to accept. Okay, can move on to the next item. So as I mentioned kind of previously, it is a, a shared purpose. This group does exist to, to really recognize the linkages between health and home, uh, home, uh, healthcare and home. And we really believe that, uh, as I mentioned previously, that it is a fundamental human right uh, for healthcare and housing. So um, as you can see here, a lot of the work is very people centered. It is focusing on the highest priority individuals first uh, to make those direct connections because that's who we're really seeing on the streets uh, experiencing unsheltered homelessness. Uh, we need um, a lot of our work to be without judgment, that we're offering that culturally safe, low barrier, inclusive care um, that was also violence and trauma informed and built on uh, an anti-racism, anti-oppression framework. Move on to the next slide. So as mentioned, we're really going to start with that uh, highest acuity first, because uh, we, we do see a lot of challenges in our community uh, from that population being unserved at the moment. And so we're really going to then focus on that uh, specific community populations uh, through that hub implementation table. It will be co-designed uh, by the community uh, to meet the needs of those individuals um, where they're at. As I mentioned before, it is very key to have the Indigenous-led response, uh, and that group will also be uh, a key component in every single aspect of uh, this health uh, and whole of community response from intake all the way through to uh, Indigenous-led housing. Move on to the next slide. So again, I'm just going to end with where we're at. So we're at the system governance piece with model development. Uh, the implementation process and tables will be established there through uh, April through June or May and June, uh, with some assist system initiation starting in uh, later this this year, summer into early fall. Uh, so there's a lot of work happening very quickly on this front. I think a number of folks on the call have have been probably part of the sessions, attended sessions, maybe you've seen where we've been at with council and the reports that have come out uh, on a monthly basis, but uh, there has been a lot of heavy lifting and a lot of work done in the last six months to uh, to really get this work done. Um, we know it has to happen faster. We know we have to help and support folks differently. Um, and so that's really where uh, the rubber is going to hit the road in the next couple of months is as these areas are co-designed uh, and stood up, we'll really see uh, hopefully some significant impacts on our community. All right, so I think now it's my turn to turn it over to Jim Yanchula, the manager of core area and urban regeneration. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm gonna be talking to you a bit about the incentives programs and funding that we have available and what's to come. Next slide. Right now we have a suite of programs that are listed in the column on the right-hand side of the screen that you see before you. Uh, as you know, we have three distinct um, components to our core area, downtown, Old East Village, and Midtown. And incentive programs are allowed to be offered through by a municipality through a community improvement plan. That's what CIP means there in the central column. So all three territories of the core area have some existing grant programs and loan programs that are available right now. Um, and if you have uh, interest in following through on any of that, um, I've got the um, uh, so website location at the bottom left of the screen, or you can contact us at CIP incentives at london.ca on the lower right hand side of your screen. I won't itemize what they all are. Uh, there's details um, on our website and and we can further answer specific questions through the web um, sort of the email address portal. 
Uh, so that's what we have now. Next slide. And what we're doing and what we do every five years is to review what programs are working in our community improvement plan areas, what could work better if they were structured differently, what new programs we might need, what programs we might need to retire because they've done their job or because they haven't done the job they intended. And we're coming to the end of that five year review. So the purpose and scope of the review is to set us up, as Scott was showing you earlier in the presentation, for um, the, count, the council's budget deliberations that will be coming up later this year. If you have thoughts on the uh, effectiveness of the plan, uh, the community improvement incentive programs or the plans themselves, uh, you can still go to the Get Involved webpage that's illustrated on the left-hand side of the screen um, and offer us your opinions. We'll be closing that down very soon, but uh, kept it open because we knew we had the town hall today and there might be some people who either weren't aware of it or had forgotten to contribute their opinions on our community improvement plans and incentive programs. So uh, stay tuned for a report out on that uh, near the end of May. Next slide. Next, we have some good news stories. Uh, we're going to start the good news stories with Natalie from our culture and entertainment and tourism perspective in Tourism London, and then I'll continue on. Take it away, Natalie. Thanks, Jim. Uh, morning, everyone. So London was really proud to have hosted the 2023 Tim Hortons Briar this past March. Um, for those of you that were able to get out and about in the core, there certainly was a different feeling uh, to our downtown, which was really nice to see. The 10 day event drew more than 95,000 spectators and produced approximately 10 to 15 million in economic impact for the city of London. Our hotel rooms were filled and two of our major venues, Budweiser Gardens and RBC Place London were utilized for the full 10 days, which was great to see. There were multiple draws each day and most people who had a full package for the event stayed in between draws downtown and really helped to contribute to that economic impact, whether they visited local restaurants or shops or attractions. Um, you know, events like this aren't possible without volunteers, and we had more than 400, including a couple that came here from Halifax, Nova Scotia, just to volunteer with us for the 10 days. So pretty incredible work that that event does. But I think one of the best parts um, was some of the, the media attention that we received. So not only was it broadcasted nationally on um, TSN and RDS and did it reach 5.9 million Canadians, but you know, locally, we had some really great news stories. CBC ran a headline about how the Briar boom helps downtown local businesses score really big. And we had a local restaurant tell us that in those 10 days, their um, sales were up 300 to 400%. That's the impact that major events can have in our core. And unfortunately, those events can't happen every single day and every single week, but it's our job at Tourism London to start to attract them again and really look at the ones that can just strategically make an impact. There's also the social impact that is important of tourists being impressed that our city looks so great on TV or as they walked throughout the core, um, you know, the timing was great, as we've just heard from other partners at the City of London, to have something positive happen in our core. You know, it's been a long winter. There are a lot of issues that we're seeing, and it was great to see people out and about and walking downtown. And it's really set us up well for future events. Um, in fact, Curling Canada is already looking at another event in coming years. Um, next slide, please. The other thing I want to highlight is just some of the amazing things that are happening this summer that you may want to take part in or, or certainly venture out to see. Um, as Canada's only UNESCO city of music, our summer is full of amazing music festivals that you definitely don't want to miss. So the first one I want to highlight is June 11th to 18th. Four City London Music Awards are hosting their 21st annual Four City London Music Week. And there's Classical Jazz World Music Awards show, industry seminars, a Latin street party, Battle of the High School Bands, um, a Women in Music Night, a Hall of Fame Street Concert, and the annual awards gala. There's so much programming that you really don't want to miss. Next slide. And then just a couple weekends later, you're going to start uh, our summer uh, festivals with Sunfest. So returning to Victoria Park, July 6th to 9th, 
this festival brings together thousands. Like, look at that photo. Thousands of people of all ages and cultures for four days of exemplary music and dance and cuisine and crafts and visual arts from all around the world. Um, it's really unique. It's high profile. It's known around the world. Um, you certainly can have conversations and, and hear in the music industry of people talk about Sunfest and the impact that it's had. Um, and it'll feature over 30 top professional world music and dance and jazz ensembles. So it'll be really great. Their lineup hasn't been announced yet, but it will be in the coming weeks and we can't wait. Next slide. Then the following weekend, it is Home County Music and Art Festival. So for the 48th annual event, it's returning to Victoria Park, July 14th to 16th. They have announced their lineup and their headliners are exceptional. They've got special guests like Terry, Tara Lightfoot, Ashley McIsaac, Stephen Fearing, and Asina B, and plus a number of local and regional acts. So it's gonna be fantastic. There's three days of performances and a vendor lineup that is shaping up to be one that you don't want to miss. So definitely mark those dates on your calendar. Next slide. And then Harris Park will be rocking, literally rocking, uh, July 12th to 15th. The Rock the Park team has worked really hard to bring um, a really robust lineup, lineup this year kind of returning back to their roots, a little bit more rock nights than anything else, but that popular hip hop throwback night still on that Friday night. Tickets for this one are selling really quickly. And it's really cool to note, you know, Mumford and Sons coming on the Wednesday night has chosen only six North American stops this summer on tour and London, Ontario is one of them. And we're really excited to welcome them there and really proud of the Rock the Park team for all that they're doing for that one. Next slide. Then there's a number of festivals taking place. Our good friends at Covent Garden Market are, are throwing some really unique events that I, I wanted to highlight. A great stop, you know, on a weekend when you're in and around the core. Beer Fest is um, June 16th to 18th. The Colombian Gastronomy Festival, uh, July 14th to 15th. The Jerk Chicken Festival is August 12th to 13th. The Taco Fest is August 25th to 27th. And the Pizza Fest is September 9th. So when you're not already at the farmer's markets that are happening weekends there, you know, maybe there's some other festivals that you want to check out. And, you know, as we're talking about the core and talking about what's next, you know, the London Knights are deep in playoffs. They begin tomorrow night again in the Western Conference Finals. You can check out games there or support um, by going to a local restaurant and, and certainly watching the game there. We're really excited as a municipality to be hosting the 2023 um, Association of Municipalities Annual Conference coming in August. That conference brings more than 1,200 municipal leaders together, all the mayors, major city staff, all of that, um, along with hundreds of exhibitors and speakers and industry and sector representatives. And it's, you know, our organizing team is working so hard to put together programming that really highlights the best of what London has to offer, but also tours and experiences that get them out and experiencing our core. And, you know, we know from hosting this before that this event can inject more than $2 million back into our economy. So we're really looking forward to hosting that one this summer. And then one final one is was just announced yesterday. Uh, 100 Kellogg Lane will be home to Lighthouse um, Lighthouse Immersive's creative critically acclaimed um, Disney animation. And if you haven't heard of it, London will be only the second stop in um, Canada for this amazing ex exhibit. And you certainly wanna check it out. It's fully immersive, great for the kids or any Disney lover. Um, and for more information, I guess, on everything that we have going on in London, you can check out our Tourism London website. It's londontourism.ca slash events for a full event schedule. You can even sign up for our monthly newsletter to have all of these events land in your inbox on the last Friday of every month. I'm going to throw it back over to Jim with some more good news core area stories. Thanks, Jim. Hi. So uh, Natalie gave you an overview of some of the major uh, events that we've come to appreciate over the years and are returning into the core places just outside of the core area boundary. I'm just going to focus a little bit on Dundas Place because the policy objective for Dundas Place is to make it London's most exciting street. And so activation and animation on Dundas Place is a core um, activity that we have our core area managers help us produce. Um, in May, we'll, we will have the events that you see listed in the bullets on the left side of your screen. And, and that's, uh, you know, 
May is on Monday. So seeing Street Salsa Fridays return every Friday, free comic book days coming up, which is Vale Night Market, Sunfest, expanding beyond its traditional home in Victoria Park and having a block party on Dundas Place again this year. Um, and then um, also recognizing um, some something new, the uh, Night Market Toronto Halal Food Tour, which will be coming on Dundas Place in May. Um, something for all tastes. Next slide. Um, so we've got the kind of tried and true that uh, Natalie spoke about um, and, and ones that she made she didn't such as the only in ov friday event series that is run by the oldies village business improvement association you'll start seeing free saturday morning tai chi classes on golden jubilee square on the south side of bud gardens um, market lane is going to have upped programming in the form of things such as poetry language classes and live music there's a uh, a new pop-up stage in Market Lane under the large um, tree there that will make for a quieter and uh, pleasant ambiance for those presentations. And this year, um, in order to increase the engagement our Aquarium Ambassadors have, we'll be staging some pop-up engagement sites where they'll be inviting in and um, people who are in the areas where they are to engage with some new activities that we haven't tried before. So some new things coming up. Next, these um, events are uh, put together ahead of time and published in our calendar of activities each month. Uh, hopefully you've seen these in the past. Um, by June, we'll have a launch for our full summer program. If you are uh, inter if you haven't seen the paper versions of this, uh, there is a digital version of it. And for an online listing of just core area events, Natalie gave you the Tourism London site for all the things that Tourism London does everywhere across the city. But the core area ones are focused at london.ca backslash core area. Next. I also think it's important to recognize the economic um, picture that is uh, emerging in the core area. And the first way uh, we wanted to do that was by pointing out the increase in residential construction in the core area. Um, riffing off a bit of what uh, Craig Cooper was saying in terms of providing um, much needed affordable housing, there is the new 72 unit development at 740 uh, Dundas at the corner of English Street. And what's important about that is, of course, the provision of affordable housing, but also the ground floor commercial retail space that knits the um, residents and their business offerings all together on that one site and on the um, Old East Village commercial corridor in general. In the downtown part of the core area, we see three cranes are on the downtown skyline. Um, this is bringing on stream over a thousand units in those three construction sites. Now, one of them is just over the official boundary of the core area on uh, 100 Fullerton Street. But that that those three projects alone are bringing in uh, above $280 million of construction development just there. Uh, and then we've got some on the horizon with the recent announcement of the 435 unit proposal at 300 King Street that um, the uh, zoning bylaw amendment was passed for. That's what's depicted on the right side of your screen. And also coming on stream, two towers proposed at 50 King Street where the former um, MLHU um, building was. So, you know, that's uh, now getting ready for new construction as well. We don't have an exact unit count on that, but it would be in the same order of magnitude as the King Street proposal. So looking at all of that, plus not forgetting that, again, in the same economic sphere as the core area, but beyond the official boundary for it, there is another um, 200 and <clears throat> Uh, 36 units at Talbot Street, um, just up the road. So this is an increasing residential population, increasing market share locally for people who will be moving in. And if we just had one occupant of each of those units, that's you know, looking at 2,000 more residents in the core uh, coming on stream very soon. Next. 
There's also um, good news in the business sector. I mean, we've had since uh, you know the middle of last year, July of 2022, uh, 30 new businesses have opened up in downtown London's Business Improvement Association area, and eight in Old East Village had opened up. And what this does demonstrate is the willingness of people to, um, even despite some of the challenges that uh, were itemized earlier on in this presentation, uh, seeing the market potential and opening up and, and doing their business in the core area. So that those kinds of opportunities will be further addressed in uh, the work that my area does both in terms of available community improvement plan in financial incentives and in that exercise that Scott mentioned at the top of this presentation through the core area vacancy reduction strategy. We are um, finalizing those and the reports will be available in May for the public to review. So that wraps up our presentation. We're now moving to the question and answer phase that will be hosted by Carmen Malia. Thank you, Jim, and uh, thank you to everyone who has joined us today. Uh, we already have some questions in the queue, but I just want to remind everyone on this call that if you do want to uh, submit a question, you can use the Q&A button located at the bottom of your screen to submit a question at any time. So we'll start with one here uh, from an individual who lives in Old East Village, and they mentioned that they're, they noticed um, a high number of closed storefronts, and they're looking for details as to how uh, the city is uh, encouraging or drawing local entrepreneurs and business owners um, to open up shop in the core area. So, uh, Jim, would you want to respond to that question? Well, there's a, a couple of answers that can be given. The first is um, the where there are business improvement associations, the business improvement uh, association is actively interested in retention and recruitment. So whether it's in the downtown area, the Old East Village area, the first place for any um, entrepreneur to go is to their business improvement association because they know the fine grain lay of the land in commercial opportunities on the commercial zone properties in their area. However, the city also uh, works in partnership with BIAs and through the incentive programs that we have, we actually have targeted uses for some of the um, areas in each of the two BIAs that offer a sweeter deal to encourage um, certain kinds of uses that um, are the best pedestrian generators in their areas. So that's what we have available now. As I mentioned, we are doing the core area vacancy reduction strategy. And through the consultation that's coming out of that, we've heard of a desire to see programs that are in other municipalities where um, there needs to be a, a little bit of a lift up or a leg up that those other municipalities give through some city programs that are not currently available here in London, but we are looking very seriously at them and intend to be outlining them more when we have our council report ready. Thank you, Jim. Uh, in that same vein, we have a question from an individual who is wondering um, what we're doing about uh, large scale companies who own vacant uh, storefronts in the core area are we providing any incentives to encourage them um, to look for new opportunities uh, for to accept new businesses? Um, I guess that might be a repeat of the last question, but if there's anything more you want to add, Jim? It is related to what I just said. Uh, it, this is about um, having more detailed uh, direction in our available financial programs and quite frankly, um, a, uh, an attempt to see if we can fund them better so that we can make the difference between what it costs to set up a business in a desirable location versus what the chargeable rents are in our local economy. Um, and we know that there's a delta, there's a gap there. We've done the analysis. It's different for different calibers or, or, or conditions of different buildings and it's also different between office and re retail but the short answer is that we're looking at um, adding more nuance to the programs that we have already so that we can do those kinds of things it it really comes down to what are municipalities allowed to do we got to go through the proper channels and that is going to be our 
um, report later on at the end of May. Thanks, Jim. A question for Craig. We have an individual who is wondering uh, where the proposed uh, hubs will be located and how many are likely to address the homelessness in the downtown core area. Thanks, Carmen. That's a, a good question. So the locations haven't been established yet. Uh, that's the work of the um, uh, the the tables that will be established in early May is to co-design sort of the, the understanding of the need of individuals who are with lived and living experience, uh, and then look to establish that across the city. As Scott mentioned earlier, their homelessness is a challenge all across the city. I see a lot of needs and a lot of challenges focused in the core, but uh, we're expecting to address a number of the needs across the city and try to make um, the services that individuals need at each hub so that there isn't maybe this uh, over uh, congregation of individuals at certain locations in the city. Thanks, Craig. Uh, in that same vein, um, we have an individual who is wondering how community members can help in the fight against homelessness in London. Yeah, it's a it's another great question. I think it really depends uh, on uh, there's many ways, and it really depends on the individual's um, uh, experience and and their interest. Right, a uh, number of organizations have volunteer opportunities. Uh, through the food bank, through meal programs, through outreach programs, through uh, clothing banks and supporting individuals in our community. Um, so I would suggest that there's a specific area they're looking to, we can we can probably give them some uh, list of individuals and organizations that are looking for volunteers uh, so that we can um, uh, get them connected. Great, thank you, Craig. Um, another question for you, Jim, around um, creating new housing units in the core area. We have an individual who's wondering if there's any initiatives in place to encourage uh, more large scale grocery stores downtown to accommodate for all the new housing coming up. Um, so again, as part of the core area vacancy reduction strategy, we saw that our programs um, don't offer the same things that other municipalities programs do in order to go after, um, uh, help sweeten the pot, if you will, uh, the attraction of something like an anchor grocery store in our um, core area or the downtown specifically. Um, but that doesn't mean that the open market isn't looking at those opportunities too. We can't we can't forget that where there's a market, the the um, independent private sector will be trying to eat it up. So that's why I was trying to explain with the residential component that traditionally a, a grocery store, a full service grocery store, to, depends on what store plate, but uh, traditionally it relies on a catchment area of about 20,000 um, households. And, you know, we probably have that in the greater core area growing, but we don't have it there quite yet. The other thing they look for is large built floor plates or large pieces of land in order to build a full service grocery store, including opportunities for parking. There are urban models that don't require this or that deal with it differently. The one that was built recently in downtown Hamilton, we're well aware of, and we have similar characteristics and similar places that could uh, on the in the market do that. We just don't know what the delta is or the difference is between what the commercial sector is looking for and what the available properties are. And our community improvement plans, um, if we had the right program to do it, could start to get involved from the municipality. But I'm encouraged by seeing the households that are being built because that's the truest indicator to somebody who's willing to plunk down a whole bunch of money to have a grocery store in the core, be sure that they've got the market to support it. Awesome. Thank you, Jim. Uh, it is 1058 now, so we have time for one more question. Um, another one for you, Jim. Um, we've mentioned a lot about, um, I guess, how we're supporting the homelessness um, population and, and future plans, but we have an individual who's wondering if we can speak briefly about some of the uh, initiatives in the core area around safety and security and how we're supporting residents and business owners. Well, from a variety of, uh, there's a team approach, first of all, from personnel. Uh, we, we work with the uh, Community Foot Patrol of London Police Service with their new uh, location on Dundas Place. And, and that, that whole team approach, the right person intervening in the right situation for the 
general resident is, you know, there's for emergencies, there always is the 911 option. You know, if, if somebody is uh, in critical condition, that's what we do. Referrals through our core coordinated informed response team uh, or even our courier ambassadors. If you're walking by and you see somebody in distress and you're just a walker, you know, you're walking down the street, we, our ambassadors are trained to know where to refer that condition to. Uh, that's part of the reason why they are walking around the street is the friendly face to ask. So you're a little bit timid to intervene yourself. You may, that might be uh, a wise move to not do so, but why not approach one of the people in the green outfits who can help on that. As far as um, property ownership, uh, we also have programs for that. The core area security enhancement grants allow um, a cost sharing uh, up to $10,000 on each property for people who want to secure their property in the core area uh, after the core area safety audit was done. So for example, if you have um, an alcove on your business and after you uh, leave your business, you want to see that it's secured, we have a program that help you install uh, features that will give you more property security. Uh, again, we're well aware of the relationship between the sense of security and the actual um, security and its impact on the commercial viability of the core. So uh, there'll be new uh, suggestions made in our core area vacancy reduction strategy. Awesome. Thank you, Jim. Um... So it's 11 o'clock now. Uh, we'll close off with a, a great comment from uh, someone in the Q&A here uh, who mentioned that uh, in recent years, they've seen the core area, uh, specifically the downtown transform when they've been out uh, on their excursions, um, cleaner, nicer, uh, made better by the visible police and the core area ambassadors, as well as washrooms, drop-in space, spaces and uh, you know new events. So really appreciate that uh, comment and really appreciate everyone who uh, joined us today. Obviously, there's a lot of great work happening in the core area. And uh, yeah, we just want to keep this momentum going. So thank you for coming out. I encourage you to follow the, the city on all of our social media channels uh, to stay up to date with information related to the core area and have a great rest of your day. Bye now. <laughs>